Hello, and good evening and welcome to Gillespie County Historical Society and Pioneer Museum. On behalf of all those people, I want to welcome you. I've seen some of you a couple days ago. I've seen some of you last month. I think I've seen some of you the previous month. I'm so glad you're participating with this uh, really fun part of the uh, 175th celebration. This is the speaker series, and so we have a collection, a number of distinguished people who have spent many years with research, uh, uncovering new uh, and fascinating parts of the culture and history in this area, and I just love it. Uh, I'm a historian from the East Coast, but I really identify with a lot of the history that's here because of its connection with our immigration story. You know, immigrants have been coming in all corners, the north, the south, the east, the west, everywhere, all over from Europe and around the world, and we have a wonderful immigration story here to tell. So, but that is a story for another day. Today, I want to welcome you all here. Just a couple of things to remind you, I always forget, just make sure that you have your uh, mobile devices, perhaps put them on um, mute or vibrate or something like that. Uh, or, or at least know where it is real quick, you know, so you can turn it off. And for some of you who are, are here for the very first time, the bathrooms are all the way down this hallway through what we call the social hall. You'll see a door go all the way to the very back, and you'll see men and ladies' restrooms. So you should be set. So I will go ahead and start now, and I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mr. Uh, Joe Kamala. Uh, so I will be glad to introduce him. Here you go, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, David. Thanks again for coming here tonight. We've had such great turnouts for all these uh, different speakers, and we appreciate you coming because it's even working on these different speakers has been fascinating for me, so hopefully it is for you too. Um, we're, we'll have one more speaker series after this, and that's, that'll be next week, uh, which is next Thursday, and it'll be at the Admiral Nimitz in the ballroom of the Nimitz Hotel, and we'll have uh, Dr. Wickham, and uh, Dr. Jello will be back to talk a little bit about the Germans and the Comanches. And so another fascinating story, which we hope you can attend. And that'll be at 7 o'clock at the Admiral Nimitz Ballroom. So um, I won't keep you all waiting. I'll have uh, Timothy Cook, who's worked a lot on this uh, project with us, come forward and introduce our speaker. Thank you and good evening. It's such a joy to be back with uh, Dr. James Kearney here tonight. And um, uh, I'd like to say a little, few words about him. He grew up on the historic 88 Ranch, which, which was established in 1833. And that ranch still remains intact after all these years. And he, that's where he makes his home with his wife, uh, Paulina von Babel Kearney and they have uh, three married children and six grandchildren. He received his undergraduate degree at the University of Texas in history and German, and his PhD was in the studies of history and Germanic studies from the University of Texas also in Austin. He served in the Army and was uh, decorated and. Uh, uh, he's author of six books, and two of which I'm going to mention now. One is The Nassau Plantation, The Evolution of a Texas German Slave Plantation. And then there was a book we'll be speaking about tonight. It also will include, it's called Friedrichsburg. It's a novel by Dr. Uh, Friedrich Armin Schubert. That was among, among two of his names, anyway. Uh, a book called 1AO, The Conscience That Was Lost, is due for publication next spring. And he's the recipient, Dr. Kearney is the recipient of the Summerfield G. Roberts Award for the best contribution to Texas history for the year 2012 for his book, Friedrichsburg, the colony of the German Fürstenverein. He was voted member of the Texas Institute of Letters, a recipient of the H. Bailey Carroll Award 
for the best article in the Southwestern Historical Quarter Quarterly in 2019, Conrad Casper Rordorf, Art, Murder, and Intrigue on the Texas Frontier. Just to say that Rordorf, the treaty that we're getting from the Texas archives uh, from Austin that would be shown on that final weekend of the 175th celebration was the treaty that, that was, was the talents of the artist uh, Conrad Casper Rordahl, and that, an, an interesting man too. And there was a famous shootout in where the slave plantation that the Ottos Varan held in, uh, in Fayette County where uh, uh, there was a murder and uh, a suspected uh, slave plot uh, still that was, was busted up. So it's quite a remarkable uh, um, story about Conrad Casper Rordahl. Podcast, Vietnam on Tape, produced by the Bob Bullock Museum in Austin, was the recipient of the gold medal for the best podcast produced by a museum in the United States of, uh, in 2019. And uh, our friend, Dr. Kearney, was a major participant in that uh, podcast that won the gold medal. Currently, Dr. Kearney is uh, a professor at the University of Texas, and I'd like to say welcome to my good friend, Dr. James Kearney. All right, let's get the show on the road. Uh, can you all hear me good? Uh, well, speaking of Rohrdorf, uh, he was killed in the shootout. Who killed uh, uh, Rohrdorf? Dr. Schubert killed him. So uh, that, uh, that's how I originally got interested in this story because uh, my first book was about Nassau Plantation and the, uh, the big shootout in October of 1847 <clears throat> uh, introduced me to Dr. Schubert and so I got uh, interested in his life and, uh, and then I realized that he had uh, his importance here uh, for the whole uh, uh, Fredericksburg story and then I realized that he had actually uh, written a novel about the foundation years of Fredericksburg where he put himself in the novel uh, in the third person. Um, Dr. Schubert did this, Dr. Schubert did that. Uh, and that um, this novel had never been translated. And so uh, I got involved in uh, translating that novel. I thought it deserved to be translated. And uh, so I became very then intimately uh, uh, acquainted with this man, this very enigmatic, controversial figure. So uh, I thought it would be a good topic to talk about him tonight and try to uh, give some overview of his life and to try to separate fact from fiction. So with that, let's get started. Um, of course, his real name was not Dr. Schubert. It was Friedrich Armand Struberg. He was uh, born in Kassel, Germany in 1806. He was the son of a very prosperous tobacco dealer. Um, he lived uh, at the Knoll House, which is the center house right here, a very grand in, uh, a house in downtown Kassel, which was also a kind of cultural center uh, for the city. Uh, uh, people like Heinrich Heine, you might be familiar with the name, famous romantic poet, Ich weiß nicht, was soll es bedeuten, dass ich so traurig bin, the famous uh, Ryan song. Um, uh, were guests at his house. Um, he uh, <clears throat> uh, also, interesting enough, his mother was French Huguenot descent, and they attended the French Huguenot church in Kassel. Now, you see the, the church in the center there. What does it remind you of? It was an eight-sided church uh, with the shape of the Ferenc Kircher. And as we will see, Dr. Schubert is the one who built the Ferenc Kircher in, uh, in uh, Fredericksburg. So obviously, it, uh, the, the, I mean, we don't know for sure, but the inference is close at hand that he modeled it on the church he attended in Kassel. Now, Dr. Schubert 
uh, was the let's see, either grandson or great grandson of the king of Sweden by a uh, marginatic marriage, it's called an illegitimate marriage, but it was recognized, and there was certain legal status to that. But his mother was the illegitimate daughter of of Frederick the First of Hessen, who became the king of Sweden. So he did have pretensions of aristocracy uh, that were, in a sense, justified. And because of this connection, he received uh, an aristocratic upbringing, which included lessons in shooting and riding. You know, riding a horse was a kind of aristocratic privilege. And he learned to shoot uh, at an early age, and he was a very striking person uh, in, in his bearing. He, he was tall and had an imposing presence even at an un, uh, a young age. A contemporary called him De Leuve des Tages, the lion of the day. He cut a, 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 a certain, a pre, he had a certain presence even as a young man. So he grew up in this very uh, privileged existence in Kassel, Germany. And um, even though they couldn't claim aristocratic uh, titles, they had aristocratic pretensions. At the age of 16, his father uh, shipped him off to Bremen to do an apprenticeship as a tobacco dealer. And uh, so that's what his father did. And uh, so he spent several years there learning the trade, but he had the first of a series of, what shall we say, um, catastrophic romantic attachments. He, he was not successful in his love life. Um, he fell in love with a, the daughter of a rich uh, uh, merchant and who unfortunately had other suitors who uh, also thought that they had a chance. And so this led to a challenge of a duel. And he was, of course, uh, trained in shooting and he won the duel. He seriously wounded his rival. And in Germany, the laws of, of dueling were, in general, looser than they were here in the United States. It depended on what state you were in, but despite the fact he would not be charged, he found it prudent, his father thought it prudent that he should, uh, that he should leave for a while. So he shipped out to New York. He arrived in 1826. Um, the upper picture is Bremen, and the lower one is New York City about this time. Um, there, uh, depending on what, you, uh, what account you read, um, he either continued to uh, serve as a, uh, a broker for tobacco, a buyer, and other accounts say he simply lived the high life. Uh, in high society, he just, uh, you know, didn't really do much in the way of, um, of, of his profession, but he just uh, moved in the higher circles of society in New York. Well, this went on for about three years, um, and then he got word, his father sent word, that he was having financial difficulties back in Kassel and that he needed his help. So he goes back to Germany and, uh, and uh, goes back to Kassel and helps his father. But in uh, 18, uh, uh, let's see, I'm getting my dates right. In 1836, he stays there six or seven years back in Germany, but his father finally uh, goes under and declares bankruptcy. And um, the young man decides to make his way uh, on his own in the New World. And so he comes back to uh, the United States. He takes a, um, a boat from Rotterdam that goes to New Orleans. And um, this is important because New Orleans was his other uh, home base in the, in the United States. He really liked New Orleans. He was fascinated by the uh, he, he developed a fascination for the black people. Uh, and the Creoles and the whole society in, um, 
in New Orleans, and he in fact wrote a book, several books, where that this, uh, 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 absolutely fantastic descriptions of, say, a Creole ball in in uh, in, in uh, New Orleans. And uh, so he, he was fascinated by this whole idea of the races and the way they, they intermingle and, 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 and mix. And he had a very, what shall I say, liberal attitude toward this sort of thing. In fact, as we'll see, he wrote the first anti-slavery novel in German literature uh, called Black Blood or Slavery in the United States. It's a trilogy. Um, Anyway, he goes from New Orleans, he makes his way back up the Mississippi and Ohio River and then by train back to New York. And for the next two or three years, he is actually um, now involved as a tobacco buyer. A makler, it's called in German. And, he, um, and in this capacity, he does a lot of traveling into the south where tobacco is grown. And he also goes to Cuba one time, so he's, he's uh, you know, representing European firms in buying uh, tobacco and, wi and widely traveled. Now, I have to mention from this point on, this story until later when he uh, comes to Texas, everything we know about him comes from him and specifically from his second novel called Bis in die Wildnis. Uh, up until the frontier. So how much of it is actually true and how much is actually a product of his poetic fantasy is anybody's guess because he, what, what shall we say, he could be loose and free with the facts at times. Um, so, um, but according to his, this autobiographical novel, uh, <clears throat> he once again falls in love with a beautiful young woman who also happens to be quite rich. And um, once again, and once again, his rivals uh, contest his, uh, his, his, uh, his uh, uh, attraction and he is once again challenged to a duel. He prevails once again, but this time he kills his rival. He doesn't wound him, he kills him. And that is murder in New York City. So he is compelled to flee. So uh, he makes his way to Cincinnati. He gets on a steamer going down the Ohio River. The steamer runs aground in Louisville, Kentucky. So um, that's Louisville up there, and that's New Orleans down here. Uh, and the the steamer sinks, so he's compelled to spend time in Louisville till they raise the ship and he can salvage his belongings. So that's what he says. And in the meantime, he makes the acquaintance of a German professor in Louisville who has a medical school. And the professor, uh, according to this, uh, Stuber's account, uh, persuades him to take up the study of medicine. And, and, we, and at this point, he adopts the name Dr. Schubert because, of course, he is a wanted man for murder. And he spends then two years in, uh, in uh, Louisville uh, studying uh, medicine, and he becomes then Dr. Schubert. You know, uh, you could, uh, the medical profession was not quite, uh, than what it is today. You could, you could actually buy a degree and hang up your shingle and call yourself a doctor. And uh, there was a lot of quackery, you know. But anyway, from this point on, he is Dr. Schubert. And once he has obtained his degree, such as it is, he makes his way down to New Orleans. And so we, we assume he, he spent most of 1842 or thereabouts in New Orleans. But he was originally on his way to the Republic of Texas because he would be safe from the law there. Of course, you know, the Republic of Texas was not part of the United States, so gone to Texas, you know, to escape uh, jurisdiction and the charge of murder. So he, uh, we think he makes it to Galveston in 1843. And uh, now I have to mention this picture here 
panorama of Galveston is from 1847, a few years later, and it was done by Caspar Rohrdorf, uh, the man he killed. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we'll, more about Rohrdorf later. So he lands in Texas in 1843, and he immediately, we think, or we know, he makes contact with Henry Francis Fisher. You all know who Fisher is, right? Fisher Miller Land Grant. Henry Francis Fisher was the same age as Struberg, but he was also from Kassel, Germany, so they most assuredly knew each other as uh, they grew up together in Kassel, Germany. So it, it, uh, it makes sense that he would look up Henry Francis Fisher. He would probably in contact with him already through letters, but we have uh, we have proof that they actually then become associated with each other through two things. Um, he, uh, Fisher underwrites a colony, uh, and we're talking about a very small colony, maybe four or five people, which was located at the confluence of Brushy Creek and the San Gabriel River, the San Gabriel and there's Brushy Creek. His colony was right there. It's a very beautiful area if you've ever driven through. There's beautiful pecan bottoms, and, and it's, the soil is really fertile. Um, and uh, we have advertisements in the Galveston paper for, uh, that, are, that is that where his name and Fisher's are together, you know, in this colonization. So we know they were associated in this. Now, in his books, uh, and he always went by the pen name Armont, which was his middle name. In his first book, uh, Travel and Hunting Adventures in North America, um, and in all his subsequent books, he talks about establishing a fort on the Leona River in South Texas, on, at, at where President Uvalde would be. That's the headwaters of the Leona River. Uh, but that most assuredly is a product of his fantasy. He was not on the Leona River. He was on the San Gabriel River. And he always, in, in he, these stories, he has uh, his trusty horse, Czar, and his trusty dog, Truth. And, that, and this is a picture from his first book of himself with Czar and Truth. Who does that remind you of? So, I mean, I, who, what Western hero had a horse and a dog? How about the Lone Ranger? Okay, we'll, 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 we'll start touch on that a little bit later. But uh, he's got his horse and his dog. But this is a fantasy. His, his uh, colony, such as it was, how many people he had, four or five, or his fort was on the San Gabriel. But it didn't last too long. So um, that is probably in 1844, 43, 44, that he has the colony on the San Gabriel. The next year, in February of 1845, um, Moisebach is staying at Nassau Plantation. He stayed there for six months in 1845. Uh, most of the winter and spring of 1845. In February, Henry Francis Fisher brings uh, Dr. Schubert to Nassau Plantation and introduces him to Moisebach. And Moisebach is obviously impressed with him. He, we have a documentation of that in his letters. He, he mentions meeting him. Uh, in the Zones Brownfells archives, we have documentation of that. And in um, that spring, uh, Moisebach offers and uh, Schubert accepts a lease on Nassau Plantation, which, however, is not till to begin to come into force until January of 1848. But, in the, but they sign a lease. That lease is filed of record in the Fayette County Courthouse. 
Um, so um, they obviously hit it off. And in the meantime, um, Moisebach is wanting to offer, he, he wants uh, Schubert to become the colonial director of the Adelsverein in Texas. And at first Schubert resists. The lease is a incentive for him to, at least for the first couple of years, to serve as colonial director. And that is to be in overall charge of both New Braunfels and Fredericksburg colonies. Finally, he accepts. He, he agrees to be uh, the uh, colonial director. And in the, in the summer of 1845, the two make their way to New Braunfels. So exactly when he is appointed, I'm not, I'm not sure whether it was in, in the, the fall of 1845 or January of 1846, but in that general facility, uh, time frame. And once he comes to New Braunfels, you know your history, there's this terrible pandemic is raging, right? And Dr. Schubert goes to work right away, uh, tending to the sick and the wounded. I'm not sick and wounded, the sick and uh, in, uh, New Braunfels. And by many uh, third party accounts of the period, he is fairly effective. He does very concrete things. Uh, he, he's very uh, conscious of, what shall we call it, social distancing. <laughs> uh, he makes sure that a lot of that the sick people are not cheek on jowl. He separates them out, and if possible, he puts them out in the open in, to get fresh air. But he's very, uh, he, uh, most accounts say that he is fairly conscientious in his efforts. And this is the beginning of the friction that develops between him and Moisebach and later becomes so bad. Because uh, in his letters, Schubert says, uh, he accuses Moisebach of not being sufficiently concerned with uh, the sick people in New Braunfels and later Fredericksburg. Okay, um, I missed, I, I, that's not the right slide, what's happened. Okay, um, I'll just stay with this. So, uh, but then he participates in, um, in, in the meantime, Moisebach has, as you know, has, uh, has, negotiated uh, for a tract of land here uh, at Fredericksburg to be a stepping stone into the Fisher Miller land grant. That happens in, uh, in 1846. And um, Schubert finally comes to uh, Fredericksburg in October of 1846. So he's here pretty early. Uh, uh, there are already settlers here, and he uh, sets up his post as colonial director here, and he serves then as the, uh, the top dog, the top man here in Fredericksburg until July of 1847 when he is fired and dismissed by Moisebach. Okay, it is his tenure here uh, as colonial director of Fredericksburg that is the subject of so much controversy. Okay, a, a, he does, he starts to do things that um, rub Moisebach the wrong way. The first thing he does is to launch an expedition into the, uh, the Fisher Miller Grant area on his own without authority that is a failure. Uh, he puts together a uh, you know train of a wagon train and several people and he he basically heads for Mason, where, what is now Mason, and he gets about as far as the Lano River uh, there at the 87 bridge and turns around and comes back. But in the meantime, he has another duel. Uh, he uh, offends several people in the party, including Lieutenant Bonnet, one of the officials who challenges him to a duel, but when Moisebach refuses to shoot with a towel over it, uh, Bonnet backs down because he knows it. But there's another guy named Gunst, 
And um, it, depending on what account you read, if you read in the Penninger book, uh, they do have the duel. He's wounded, and then uh, he knows he's never going to get better, and he commits suicide. Guntz does. Um, other people say that the, the, the duel never took place, that Guntz sh accidentally shot himself, but whatever the, um, the uh, real truth of the matter is, uh, people were realized that he was quite a good shot, and uh, like Benet, uh, they, they backed down. Okay, uh, I will... Uh, I will get back to a balance sheet of the good and the bad that Dr. Schubert did uh, while during his reign at, um, as colonial director here in Fredericksburg. But I should point out that um, if you really get, want to get a sense of what it was like for the foundation year, his, his own novel about the foundation year despite all its uh, exaggerations and its obvious tooting its own horn, it, it does give a sense of uh, what it was like here. And in that sense, it's very valuable. Uh, but like once again, we'll get back to the controversies uh, here in just a moment. But to make a long story short, this growing antagonism between Schubert and Moisebach grows and gets worse and worse. And finally, it comes to a breaking point. Dr. Moisebach uh, uh, feels like uh, Schubert is a loose cannon. He feels like he's misappropriated funds. In one of his letters, he criticizes Schubert for building the Vereinskirche at uh, company expense. Uh, he, he said, haven't you ever heard of separation of church and state? Those are his words. Uh, but that wasn't the real uh, problem. The, uh, the real problem was that he just felt like uh, Schubert was a loose cannon and was not, uh, he, he said to him, your job is, is not to ask questions, your job is to follow orders. That was Schubert's, uh, I mean Moisebach's words to Schubert and that's what he was not doing that he didn't like. But in the summer of, uh, of 1847, it came to light, Moisebach found out that Schubert was an imposter, that that was not his real name, that his real name was Friedrich Armand Struberg, and for him that was a straw that broke the camel's back. His last, Moisebach resigned, he turned in his letter to the uh, to the society in Germany, uh, uh, but his last official act was to dismiss uh, Dr. Schubert as colonial director and withdraw his lease on Nassau Plantation. Not to honor it because he had signed it under a false name. This led to what uh, the Germans called the catastrophe, the catastrophe. Now, it is not generally appreciated what an important event this is, not only uh, in Schubert's life, but also for the whole colonization venture of the Adelsverein. This is a turning point. It's a very important thing. So basically, what happened is when he was fired, Dr. Schubert, um, and from this point on, we will call him Struberg, because that was his real name, and he's been outed. Goes back to Fayette County, to LaGrange. He is a Mason. Struberg has become a Mason, and through his Masonic connections, uh, he is able to uh, get some supporters, Anglo supporters, principally a man by the name of Mayfield, uh, to help him take over the plantation by force. And uh, with a couple of ruffians, uh, people who work for this Mayfield guy, a, a man by the name of Absalon Bostick and another by the name of Benjamin Breeden, they uh, ride up, they pistol whip the, over, the director of the, of the uh, plantation, uh, 
uh, a man by the name of Zergel, and they ensconce themselves in the manor house, the Heron house at the plantation. In the meantime, uh, Moisebach has been uh, replaced by Hermann Spies as commissioner general. And when Spies hears of this, he goes to uh, New Braunfels where there are quite a few officials of this society, over 20 officials are, make their home in New Braunfels. And he puts together a party of seven men and then they ride uh, to uh, Round Top near the plantation. They stay at Zergel's house. And then in the morning of October the 27th, 1847, um, while it's still dark in the morning, they creep up to the plantation and they are ambushed. Now, there are several different accounts of this, plant, of this fight but um, it now, I tend to go with Hermann Spies' account. He wrote a very detailed account, and he said that uh, the slaves, that uh, uh, Schubert and his men had gotten wind of them coming up, and they were waiting for them and ambushed them. And uh, so there is a ferocious gun battle. Um, and in this gun battle, one person on each side is killed. And unfortunately, Kasper, Conrad Caspar Rohrdorf, the artist who is now the official artist of the German Immigration Company in Texas, he was employed by Moisebach to be the official artist. He's the man who did the Comanche Treaty. Uh, and he had done 20 drawings of the colonies of the hill country of Fredericksburg, of this area of Enchanted Rock. Uh, was in the party and he was the one that was killed. Uh, so this, this is an incredible uh, dramatic event. Um, and uh, le just let me set the stage. Uh, Rohrdorf was uh, the most famous artist in Texas at the time. He had already established his reputation in, Germ in Germany and Switzerland. He was well known, it's incredible. His drawings were valued in the litigation in Fayette County at $2,000, those 20 I mean, $2,000 would buy you 2,000 acres of land then. So you see, and I just wanna go very quickly through uh, some of, of uh, Rohrdorf's published uh, picture. He had already published several books of landscape Port in Germany. So th these are Rohrdorfs. And there's a style of uh, landscape portraiture that's called Veducci, where you have these sweeping panoramas, always dramatic clouds, always people in the foreground. These little characters are always, you see in every single one of these, they have these sweeping panoramas. And that, uh, that is also reproduced uh, in his panorama of, New Br of, uh, of uh, Galveston that I showed you earlier. So this is a big deal. The artist is, is killed, but Struberg got away with his portfolio of drawings. How do I know that? Because uh, the Adelsrein, or the, the uh, uh, Benet, sued to recover them in uh, Fayette County Court. So the litigation is there. He sued Struberg to, to, recover, to get the drawings back. But when you sue to do something like that, you're required to, to post a bond, double the value of the property, and the Adelsrein could not come up with the money. Struberg got, the, the suit was dismissed. He got away with the drawings. Okay, now, what I wrote about in the Southwestern Quarterly really was I tried to find the provenance. I tried to trace and see if those drawings ever resurfaced. If we could say and identify that some of those drawings had surfaced. And I did positively identify several of these drawings. They did resurface in German publications. They were. Several of them were published in what was called Meyer's Lexicon. 
under uh, a different name. So if, if you want to know that story, you'll have to read the article because it's kind of detailed. But here is the fascinating thing and an insight into our man's character. Struberg's first book, Amerikanisches uh, Jagd und Reiseabenteuer, American Hunting and Travel Stories, uh, which was published in 1957, with 24 drawings done by the author himself. <laughs> Five of those drawings were lost Rohrdorfs. I'm absolutely convinced. I can't prove it, but I can make a compelling case. And that's what I did in the article. And this is one of them, the first picture of Enchanted Rock was done by Rohrdorf. That was one of the drawings that appeared in Struberg's book. There's no evidence that Dr. Schubert was ever there. There is evidence that Rohrdorf was there. It is in the style of the Vaducci. Dramatic clouds, the sleep, uh, everything fits the pattern. This is the Llano River, a spring in the hill country. Beavers at Dickinson Bay. Now, Struberg was never at Dickinson Bay, but we know that Rohrdorf was. So, uh, I'm convinced that five of the 24 drawings, at least five of the 24 drawings in Struberg's first book were the stolen drawings from Rohrdorf. We also know that he did the Comanche Peace Treaty. Okay, so that's all in this, uh, the July 2019 issue of the quarterly, if you care to read it. Okay, uh, in the wake of this shootout, uh, it has all kinds of tentacles that go in all different directions. Uh, just briefly, it led to another shootout on the streets of LaGrange between uh, Bostic, one of the men who was in the at the plantation, and Mayfield himself, in which Mayfield killed Bostic and revealed the largest criminal plot in Texas history up to that time. Bostic was part of a multi-state slave-stealing ring, and he was playing a double game on Schubert. It's a complex story. We can't go into it now, but that was one offshoot. But for, for us, what concerns us is that shootout marked a turning point in the Adelsfreund's efforts in Texas. Uh, when, because there was a lot of litigation, Hermann Spies was accused of murder. He stood trial for murder in LaGrange. He was acquitted, but it cost the, the society an enormous amount of money. Struberg uh, sued the German immigration company for breach of contract and won in Fayette County and was paid $3,000 indemnity by the German immigration company for breach of contract. That's a lot of money, okay? The society didn't have that money. Moreover, it inflamed anti-immigrant sentiment in Texas because Mayfield, the same Mayfield, was a anti-immigrant uh, rabble-rouser in the state legislature. He was a legislator who uh, was warning the good uh, slaveholders of Texas that these German immigrants were anti-slavery and they were diluting the pro-slavery uh, sentiment and, and, they sh and, and the immigration should be stopped from Germany. And uh, this whole shootout played into his hands. It brought the society into disrepute in Texas in a time when it needed the goodwill of the legislature. You see what I'm trying to say? It, it really created a public relations nightmare, a financial nightmare, which led the, the leadership in Germany in January of 1848 to shut down the office uh, and, and, and dismiss all but uh, uh, two or three people 
in Texas. They shut down their office in January of 1848 and ended the whole, uh, except for a few caretakers, the whole colonization effort. And it was all precipitated by this shootout. You see, that's why. And so that is Schubert's worst legacy. I mean, that shootout marked a turning point in a much bigger way than, than even his activities here in Fredericksburg. Okay. All right, what happens to Schubert? He gets his money, he wins his suit, he's hanging around for all this litigation because most people assume that Spies was the aggressor uh, at, in the shootout, where in, in, in point of fact, he probably was not. He was ambushed by uh, these people who had pr knowledge that they were sneaking up. He goes to Camden, Arkansas in 18. He leaves Texas in 1848. We know that. Now he claims, and he wrote a couple of novels saying, claiming he was in the Mexican War. You can dismiss that. He was not in the Mexican War. Uh, that, no, there's no way he could have squeezed in uh, service in the Mexican War and, and all this, so, which is taking place, you know, while this is going on. He goes to Camden, Arkansas. Or is AK Arkansas or is that Alaska? Anyway, uh, he goes to Arkansas, and uh, Camden is a is a pretty place. It's on uh, it's on a river. Let me see. I have a picture of Camden, Arkansas. It's on the on the uh, Quashita River, and um, once again, uh, he falls in love with a beautiful uh, heiress. Uh, and uh, is engaged to be married, is doing well. He's hung out his shingle as a doctor again. And, um, but then there's one of these life-changing events, uh, which is true, he gets stung in the eye by a bee. And um, <clears throat> he tries to do things, but you know, he decides eventually it's uh, such a problem that he's going to go back to uh, Germany f to seek treatment. Because of course, Germany at this time has the best medicine in the world, the most advanced medicine. I mean, it's quackery here, you know, either you're a, a steam doctor where they cook you to death if you're sick, or, or there's this so-called homeopathic medicine where they poison you to death with mercury. I mean, uh, you know, most, um, the state of medicine is pretty primitive in the United States. It's a little more scientific in, in Germany at this time. So he goes back to Germany. And from this point on, uh, they're able to, they're not really able to do a lot for him. So he wears a patch over his eye from this point on, you know. He goes back to Kassel and he lives with his one sibling, a sister, who's a, a spinster. And uh, they apparently still have enough family money to have a very nice house. And he starts hanging out in a uh, upscale uh, restaurant and uh, a sort of a stammtisch there. Uh, people sit around and he starts spinning tales about his adventures in Texas. And the, and the crowd starts growing and growing and he cuts an amazing uh, figure as he walks around the streets of uh, Kassel. He's this real tall guy, you know, and with slender with this incredible uh, mustache. I wish I could grow a mustache like that. It goes out here and it's, uh, you know, he's, he, he is a striking figure. And uh, he wears these exotic clothes and uh, the word begins to spread that this guy is really interesting. And um, eventually one of his uh, table mates there uh, at his stammtisch uh, prevails upon him to write down his, some of these stories. And uh, from that, eventually he resists the idea, but he, uh, he, uh, that becomes then the beginning of an incredible new career. He reinvents himself as an author and he becomes a very successful famous Arthur. And that is why uh, in some ways, I, mean, I think it might be safe, uh, Glenn can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think next to Admiral Chester Nimitz, 
he is the most famous person to ever come or to be associated with Fredericksburg, Texas because uh, he becomes quite well known and an important figure in the new genre of adventure novels. Uh, so a little bit more. These are some of the t few titles of the 20 novels he writes in 50 volumes. Because many some of these novels have more than one or two. They're in volume one, volume two. Um, so this first one up here is his anti-slavery novel, Schwarzes Blut, Black Blood, or Slavery, in three volumes. Bis in die Wildnis, Up into the Wilderness, On the Indianergrenze, On the Indian Frontier, Jagd und Reise, Abenteuer. It goes on and on. Uh, so he is published by Kotta, which is one of the most publish, uh, prestigious publishing houses in Germany. His books go through many editions. They are still in print in Germany. They're still in print, um, some of them. And um, so he makes a very comfortable living. He, I mean, uh, he had this incredible flexibility of being able to reinvent himself at, at various crossroads in his life. And um, so, that is, are the stages of his life, and, and he lives to be quite old. So from 1857 to 1889, he lives the life of a prominent, uh, famous author. Um, he, uh, one other interesting thing, uh, one day someone knocks on his door, and it is none other than the first woman whom he fought a duel over way back in Bremen. Her, her name was Antoinette Rosie Henrietta Zottler. And she knocks on his door. He's now, you know, in his 50s. Uh, and it's his long lost love. They get married. And so that is his first real marriage. But unfortunately, uh, he doesn't realize that she had spent most of the intervening years in an insane asylum. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, it, it only lasts a year before uh, she has another uh, bout with insanity, and this time uh, she dies in a sanatorium. So that didn't last long, and that was, so he did not have a very successful love life. How far along are we? Huh? And the peace treaty. How, what was it, his involvement with the peace treaty? Peach tree? Peace tree? Peace tree. Peace tree. Peace tree. Oh, the peace treaty. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. So I'm going to wrap up, and we're going to we're going to look at a few of these things. Okay. Um, and then I'll take questions. But first, let's just look at a balance sheet of his uh, complex personality and both his good and bad traits. So I say, uh, wait a minute, what is this? Yeah, that's the one. I want to put the good traits first. Uh, he had very refined manners, of course. He was a very imposing guy. He's the sort of guy when he walked in a room, people took notice. Okay, there are people like that, you know. We envy them. Uh, he was multicultural. He was uh, uh, trilingual. He spoke English fluently um, and French and, of course, German. From all accounts, third-party accounts, he was very conscientious as a doctor. Now, whether he was effective or not is another thing, but at least he, he was empathetic and tried to be a good doctor. He took his duty seriously. He was empathetic sympathetic toward Native Americans and black people. Now you have to understand this is really an unusual sentiment for the period and for somebody who comes from the South. He portrays an, uh, in his book, Friedrichsburg and other books, he takes pains to present the Native American point of view as an existential threat 
the encroachment of white people in their territory as an existential threat. He understood that. He was sympathetic, even though he said this process is irreversible and inevitable. They will be displaced. But I understand where they're coming from. That attitude is in all his books. And it is such a contrast with Anglo writing of the same period, where you never encounter sympathy for the native. They're just savages. Uh, that need to be, as our second president of the republic said, my policy toward the Indians is either expulsion or extermination, close quote. So this is a different attitude. The only other person that shared it that I know, the two people that shared it was President Sam Houston, actually, was a friend of, of the Native Americans and also uh, Jim Neighbors, the Indian agent, who was also here in Fredericksburg. But other than that, it was, that's a rare idea. Um, some, at least, claim that he was uh, a good leader. Now, I'm not going to, uh, I'm just, the, the most extensive biography we have was the life and works of Friedrich Armand Schuberg by a man named Preston Albert Barba, who wrote a, his doctoral dissertation around the turn of the century. And in the back, he has a letter, a copy of a letter signed by 77 prominent citizens of Fredericksburg in support of Dr. Schubert when he was fired. So um, there were some who thought he, he had done a good job. He was, as a person, incredibly flexible and adaptable. I mean, and he reinvented himself at every crossroads in his life in a way that you have to, uh, even though he, he, he used chicanery and deception, it's still, in a sense, you can't help but be a little bit uh, in, in awe of it. Now, his bad traits, he was an imposter. He assumed an identity, and whether or not he was a real doctor is uh, up. It, it, I mean, he, all we know is what he, he wrote in his book. We, there is no independent evidence. I mean, a, a certificate is never, or a, a what you call a diploma, has never surfaced to substantiate this. We know he was a thief, he stole the Rohrdorf drawings, he was a plagiarist, he claimed them as his own in his first book. He was prone to violence. He killed, or at least was a party, to the death of three men. But I think the main characteristic is that he was a classic narcissist. That is a personality disorder of somebody who loves himself, uh, cannot accept criticism, cannot accept to lose, cannot accept to have somebody above him, and he was a romantic narcissist to boot. He really was a romantic, he had a romantic sensibility in the sense that, uh, of Rousseau, of, you know, and the noble savage and that sort of thing. Um, so that sums up his character traits. Now let's look at both his positive and negative legacies for Fredericksburg and the Adelsverein. We know from independent sources that he was conscientious in working to alleviate the pandemic, first in New Braunfels and then in Fredericksburg. He is the man who built the Vereinskirche, which is the emblem of Fredericksburg. I mean, that's the symbol. He is the one who conceived it and built it, and he built it in the model of the church he attended in Kassel. There are many different sources that corroborate this. And one of the chapters in his book is the laying of the cornerstone for the Vereinskirche. I mean, he, he talks about it in the book. He said, Dr. Schubert did this, did that, you know. <clears throat> now, here's something that, I mean, you're, that to me is very important that is almost gone unnoticed. He cultivated a relationship with the Delaware Indians. And the Delaware Indians were very important in the early history of Fredericksburg, Texas. 
they were the go-between between the Comanches and the Anglos and the Germans. They negotiated all the treaties. They were linguistic supermen. Jim Shaw, who is young bear in the book, uh, is a signatory of the German Comanche Peace Treaty. He was the interpreter. But beyond that, the Delawares supplied the early settlers with bear oil. And that was the only thing, the only oil they had to cook with in 1846 and 47 was bear oil. They, uh, they were here, you know, when you go to, you go out the road toward Junction, you go by Delaware Creek, right? That's where they camped. They stayed here. They, uh, and the Delaware Indians play a role. He was very impressed with these uh, Indians, and, and, and they're, they're not large in number. They're few, but they're, they played a very important role. And um, they play an important role in all of his books the Delaware Indians. And he was very impressed with Jim Shaw. Uh, that was his Anglo name. He, he was an incredibly imposing guy. Uh, he stood very tall and uh, he was the, the most important intermediary in negotiating with the Comanches because there was not one Comanche Indian who spoke English or German. And there were no uh, Anglos or Germans who spoke Comanche. But Jim Shaw could speak English perfectly, and he could also speak Comanche and other Indian languages as well. So he was, like Sam Houston said, where's Jim Shaw? Okay, so through him we get an appreciation for the Delaware Indians. Uh, he did cultivate peaceful relations with the warlike tribes, principally the Comanches. Uh, so you ask, what was his role in the treaty? Well, that was mainly, that's mainly Moisebach's legacy. Nobody can take that away from him. That's Moisebach's crowning achievement, and he deserves all the credit in the world. But behind the scenes, in that respect, uh, uh, Struberg is not working against Moisebach. He is also a signatory of the treaty. His name is on it as well, Schubert. Okay, he cultivated a relationship with the Mormons, the nearby Mormons at Zodiac. And if, you know, as you go over here, right back here to the square, you see a, a replica of an overshot mill wheel. That, and a little sign, that something to the effect that we, we're grateful, to, we're internally grateful to the Mormons who saved us. Something like that, words to that effect, because the Mormons knew how to farm on the semi-arid uh, climate here. They knew, and they had a mill up and running in six weeks, which not only was they were able to, um, you know, grind corn into meal, but they were also able to convert it to saw lumber, planked lumber. Up to that point, they had no planked lumber. And so they're just four miles apart, a symbiotic relationship, a mutually beneficial relationship developed between the Mormons and the Germans here. And there is more information about that in that book than any other source anywhere on the face of the earth uh, about that relationship. So to me, that is a positive legacy of Schubert that he left us with insights into the foundation years here uh, that we get from nowhere else. Even though a lot of it is embellished, okay? I mean. Okay, negative legacy. There's no question that he worked to undermine Moisebach and his efforts to satisfy the terms of the Fisher-Miller land grant. He is working and he develops a little clique of sycophants like most narcissist people. They have to have uh, admirers and yes men, you know, around them. And he had, he, he had that clique here in Fredericksburg and he rewarded those who praised him and he punished and persecuted those who were against him. Okay, and that is a legitimate criticism. 
He misappropriated funds. Although in his defense, he claimed he did that to buy medicines that Moise Bach refused to, to uh, provide. He lived a pretty high life, too, uh, style here. He had his own house and cook, and uh, he never was out with, without the you know, wine and the finer things of life. But the, his main legacy, negative legacy, is the shootout at Nassau Plantation, which, in my opinion, was uh, directly his responsibility. He was responsible for that catastrophe, not Hermann Spies, even though that goes against conventional wisdom. <clears throat> so, you know, he has both positive and negative things. Okay, um, now, his literary legacy, uh, the very prominent uh, literary critic Jeffrey Sammons, uh, a, an American, uh, has made the claim that Struberg invented the Western. I mean, the Western Western as opposed to the Eastern Western. You know, he didn't, you know, the leather stocking tales are Eastern Western. But Friedrichsburg you could make the case, is the first Western Western ever written. Uh, it is the beginning of this new genre. Why? Because it has all the elements. Think of the searchers. John Wayne, that movie, The Searchers, is set in Monument Valley in Arizona, the dramatic Western landscape. You have a captive narrative. Uh, you have good versus evil. Uh, all those elements appear for the first time in this novel. You have the landscape itself as an antagonist in the novel. You know, the, the, land, the Western, the exotic Western, it, its evocative nature is always a part of the novel. You have a morality story, a good versus evil. You have a love story. And you have an Indian captive narrative, okay? And in the case of this, it's based loosely on the Cynthia Ann Parker captain narrative, where the, where the bad Indian, Katumzi, who was a historical figure, steals a beautiful Ludvina, captured her, and in the end is rescued by none other than Jim Shaw, the Delaware Indian. And the novel ends in a very, uh, it, it has a very uh, psychological deal. In the wedding where Rudolph and Luvina get married and the whole town comes together and they have a dance, the Delaware Indian gets to have the honorary dance with Luvina. And that has certain sexual uh, forbidden, that was a forbidden thing at the time, okay? It has certain forbidden sexual undertones to it which creep into all of his novels. Um, so, uh, but, uh, Sammons makes the case that this is the first Western Western ever written. So that is the legacy. I mean, you have a guy, a famous, uh, I mean, this is where the West, Westerns begin with this guy. Uh, so uh, it's important. Now, he also wrote the first anti-slavery novel in German literature. He described Native Americans in minute detail. So his novels are of great ethnological importance. Exactly, I mean, he describes how he contrasts the Comanches with the Apaches with the Delawares, how they dressed, how they behaved. And he is said to be an artist now, whether he really was or not, but he has an artist eye for, for very description. The centerpiece of the novel is the grand entrance of the Comanche chiefs into Fredericksburg to sign the treaty in May of 1847. He describes these Comanche chiefs, how they're dressed, their horses, in minute detail. And it's very important because if you look at the pictures of Lungvitz or Petri, He's right on. He's not making this up. I mean, he was there. He saw them. He described them. So the, these descriptions are very important. 
As I said, he emphasized the role of the Delaware Indians and their role has been largely forgotten. It was, they played a role in Texas history way out of proportion to their numbers. Uh, through his novel Friedrichsburg, he provides us with a rich insight into the everyday challenges of life in the town during the foundation years. And by the way, there is a sequel to, this no to that novel that has never been translated called Die Geraubten Kinder. The, 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 kid, the, the kidnapped children or the stolen children to also takes place here in Fredericksburg. <clears throat> hmm? uh, I need to clone myself. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm ending finally. Uh, he wrote 20 novels, 10 of which are based on the frontier life uh, in Texas. Only one has been translated. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Okay. Now, my conclusion, and I'm done. He was a scoundrel, yes. Uh, Moisebach is the real hero, yes. But he should not be disremembered for that. He deserves a place in Fredericksburg. He deserves to be remembered. He is part of the richness of Fredericksburg. And so uh, let's, uh, let's not forget him. Thank you very much. Thank you.